When we left off, we learned about the math method of solving genetics problems, and now we're going to move on to some other concepts in genetics. For example, if you have a purple flower, it can either be big P, big P, or big P, little P. How are you going to know? You can't just look at it and figure out the alleles that are found on the homologous chromosomes. So how are you going to figure out the genotype from the phenotype? The answer is a test cross. When you cross a unknown purple phenotype plant, or any dominant phenotype, with the recessive, you can analyze the offspring to try to figure out what the, the genotype was of the dominant phenotype parent. Remember that to get white flowers, there's only one way, little p, little p, in order for that to occur. So you know the genetics of a recessive phenotype plant, but you don't know the genotype of a dominant phenotype plant. A test cross. So let's say we don't know if the purple flowers are big P, big P, or big P, little p. If we cross it with a white flower, little p, little p, there's one of two possibilities. And the first possibility, if the purple flower plant is big P, big P, and you cross with little p, little p, 100% of the offspring will be purple, big P, little p. However, if the purple phenotype plant is big P, little p, a heterozygote, and you cross with little p, little p, that means that you'll get approximately 50% big P, little p when you do the cross, and 50% little p, little p. Now, the only thing that really helps you in figuring out the genotype is whether or not you get white flowers. Because in both cases, whether it's big P, little P, or big P, big P, you get purple flowers. But if you get any white flowers, that tells you that the genotype of the parent that's purple is big P, little P. If you didn't get any purp, uh, white flowers, then you really don't know what that genotype is. And that's a test cross. At this time, let's go and write down in your notes what a test cross is about. Now, you're going to be printing, um, writing out your notes on a sheet of paper. Uh, this is not going to be a pictorial notes for this part of your lecture on chapter 14 genetics. So at this point time, pause the video and back up the, the presentation and if you need to, uh, review a test cross and write down what it means. Here we have some other information. You can review this at the end of the, uh, the topics on genetics. However, for now, uh, you should have that in your notes already. Also, uh, last class we did this. Uh, we did a cross using the math method. Try to use the math method to answer the question uh, at the bottom of this uh, of this screen. Chi square test. We're going to be uh, doing some practice problems with chi-square in class, so we're going to save this for a future class, probably on either uh, Friday or Monday of next week. All right. At this time, I'd like you to copy down this table, and um, what you're going to do is tell, uh, you're going to figure out what it is for each one of these concepts and an example of it. And you should be able to be able to figure out a, uh, a cross using some of these concepts if it's uh, things like X-linked genes, and we'll talk more about that as we get to it. Pause at this time and copy this down on a fresh sheet of paper. Leave plenty of sp uh, space in the uh, table to write some notes. You could also write down your notes on the handout that's being printed out. Mendel work with a si simple system. However, genetics is a lot more complicated than just simple dominance and recessive. For example, a concept called incomplete dominance. Now, remember with purple and white flowers, they don't blend together. But in carnations and snapdragons, if you have a red flower, that's going to be just like with simple dominance and genet of, of dominance and recessive. We have big R, big R. That gives us red flowers. And for white flowers, it's little r, little r. No difference between regular genetics at all. However, in incomplete dominance, the g genotype, big R, little r, or the heterozygotes, produce a blending of the two traits. And uh, you can kind of think of it as like paint being mixed together. Uh, red paint plus white paint makes pink paint. And this is called incomplete dominance. Carnations are an example. And the only real difference is that in the heterozygotes, the um, phenotype will be a blending of the two characteristics. Go ahead and, and go back to your notes. And let's write down what the, uh, the incomplete dominance concept is all about. Here we have our cross, red and white, making pink. Remember that if red was dominant to uh, white, they would all turn out to be red. 
And over here we have uh, more pink flowers, and again, the heterozygotes appear pink instead of red because the two traits are blended together. And this is called, again, incomplete dominance. Here we have a slightly different way of uh, looking at this. The C, don't worry about that, this is just a colored gene. So we have big R, big W, they're just alleles for color. Big R, big W, we're just talking to heterozygote. And then if we cross that, R and W, R with W, you get uh, big R, big R for red, big W, big W for white, and then the blending are the heterozygotes. And that's the important part. The heterozygotes show a blending of the traits, like mixing paint in a bucket. Codominance is different from incomplete domi dominance. Now, if you remember with incomplete dominance, you have a blending of traits. However, in codominance, if you have the two alleles, they're both dis uh, shown separate and distinguishable from each other. They're not a blending of the two. An example would be the ABO blood groups. And this is also an example of multiple alleles. There's more than two alleles for blood types. Here we have three alleles. We have the A allele, and these are just basically glycoproteins or cell markers on outside of red blood cells that are involved with immunity. And um, we'll talk more about that fourth quarter. But you should know that blood groups are an example of multiple alleles, three alleles, and codominance, which I'm going to explain now. If you get the A allele, uh, you'll have A blood. If you get the B allele, you'll have B blood. The I allele is like an absence of any kind of uh, marker on the outside of the cells that causes an immune response. But the real issue with codominance is that if you get both the A and the B allele, it's not a blending of the two. A is not dominant to B. B is not dominant to A. They're both going to be shown on the outside of the red blood cells. So someone with AB blood is getting both the A allele and the B allele to have both A and B cell markers on the outside of their cells. Another example of codominance that might be easier to understand are chicken feathers. If you have a white chicken and a black chicken, it doesn't make gray feathers. That would be something like incomplete dominance. They actually make black and white feathers. They're shown distinct and separate from each other. And again, that would be another good example of codominance. Going back to blood types, if you have the genotype big A, big A, you're going to have type A blood. A blank, the little I here, represents no allele for um, any kind of cell marker on the outside of red blood cells, also will give you A blood. So you can think of A as being dominant to uh, the little I here, which just means nothing. I usually put a little dash here just to kind of remind myself. B and B, or two B alleles, or B and nothing gives you B blood. If you have the A and B allele, however, you have type AB blood, and you show both type A and B um, cell markers on the outside of your red blood cells. And this is the part that really kind of hammers home that idea of codominance. If you have nothing, II, which is just basically blank blank, you're not going to have anything on the outside of your red blood cells. It's not going to cause any immune response, and um, that's what type O blood means. You're not going to have anything on that side of red blood cells that can cause a problem for the immune system. That's why O blood is good for giving to other people. Um, there's nothing on that side of the blood cells, so there's no rejection issues. And that's not dealing with positive and negative Rh factor. Uh, this is just dealing with blood types. Blood compatibility. So if you, we're going to talk about this in a future class. We're going to save this till uh, fourth quarter when we talk about the immune system. So you're not going to have to know this for the test. You should know, however, that type A blood is big A, big A, or big A blank. Type B blood is big B, big B, or B, big B blank. Type AB blood is having one of each allele. There's only one genotype for that. Type O blood is like blank, blank. At this time, we're going to do a quick uh, Punnett square showing you how blood types work. Now, let's say we have a parent that is AB, and we have another parent that is, let's say, O. If you do this cross, you can kind of see this as A, B, crossed with blank, blank. And if you do the cross on this, we get A, B, blank, blank, A, blank, A, blank, B, blank, Blank. So in a cross between a parent that's AB and a parent that's O, these are the types of uh, blood types you can have. A blank gives you A blood, A blank, A blood, B blood, or B blood. There's no possibility of getting AB blood or an AB uh, child 
between these two parents. This is also used in paternity tests. If the mom is AB and the dad, we'll put a question mark here, is O, and the kid has AB blood, you can't have that AB blood from that dad. So this is one way to eliminate possible fathers. However, if the kid had B blood, that doesn't necessarily mean the, the dad is actually the dad, but it c he could be the dad, and you'd have to have further genetic tests done. And that's how you do these problems with, uh, with blood types. Here's another example. Let's say we have a dad that's uh, B and a mom that's A. Now remember, there's two ways to have B. You can have either BB or B blank. Mom could either be AA or A blank. And we really don't know which one it is unless we did some kind of genetic test. So in this cross, what we could have is either BB with AA to get AB, and we can do this. Uh, or if the, the child was blank blank, that really tells you a lot about mom and dad. If we're sure that's the mom and dad, the only way that could happen is if dad was, or if mom was A blank, and dad was B blank, then both parents can give a blank to have the kid that has O blood. So if the kid does have O blood, that is possible between an A and B mom, uh, you know, A mom and B dad, but that means that they can't be uh, two of that uh, allele. All right. So go ahead and copy down some notes. If you want to write this down, you can. And then we're going back to the PowerPoint. All right, let's stop at this point and uh, figure out what the right answer is. So we have mom, that's either going to be A blank or AA, we don't know. The two possible dads are B and AB. So the kid is O, or O, which is blank blank. So how is that possible? Now keep in mind that this dad had to give either an A or a B to the kid. So the kid is going to um, have to get you know half of its gametes or half of the alleles from the dad. And if dad has to give either a B or an A, this blood type is not possible. So this person is eliminated as a possible father. Now this B could be B blank, and mom could be A blank. And as we just showed before, if you crossed A blank with B blank, you could get a kid with O blood type. And so that means that uh, this guy could be the father, the guy with B blood. So going back to our presentation. Mailman is not off the hook. The deli clerk is. Pleiotropy. Pleiotropy is where one gene can affect more than one characteristic. For example, the gene for dwarfism affects all the body parts of a person and makes all the body parts smaller. Uh, so dwarfism and uh, the opposite, gigantism, are one gene having multiple effects. And that's what you have to know about pleiotropy, one gene having multiple effects. There's a place in your notes to write this information down. Let's go and do that at this time. Most genes are pleiotropic, so that means there's a lot of genes that have multiple effects. And uh, dwarfism and gigantism are two examples. You might have heard of Andrea Giant. If you ever saw The Princess Bride, he had um, gigantism. And again, the one gene had multiple effects, made him a larger person. Now, there are some diseases that are also pleiotropic. And two diseases you should know are cystic fibrosis and sickle cell. If you have the cystic fibrosis gene, it's going to have multiple effects in the sense that you're going to have coughing up uh, a lot of phlegm. You're going to choke on your... Uh, uh, the mucus being produced, uh, the, the linings of your organs get covered with mucus and that causes some other problems. There's a lot of problems from the one gene being defective in cystic fibrosis. So that is a pleiotropic um, concept. Sickle cell anemia also has the same thing kind of going on. Sickle cell is where we have a misfolded hemoglobin protein that causes the whole cell to sickle. And as a result, the sickled cells get stuck in the uh, the smaller arteries and veins and causes things like heart attack and joint pain and strokes and all kinds of stuff 
many effects from one gene being uh, not working correctly. This ends part uh, three of your genetics notes.